Welcome to the Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate Podcast, brought to you by Vertical Street Ventures, where we talk to top experts and seasoned investors to help provide clarity and key insights to keep you safe on your journey to financial freedom. Our goal is to help you get educated on how to create passive income for you and your family using real estate as your vehicle. If you enjoy the show, please go to iTunes and leave a rating and a written review to help us grow and reach more listeners. So the VSV2 fund we're launching here and we're really excited about it because the team has been hard at work researching funds, researching the right structure, making sure it's the right fit for our investors for the last 12 months. A lot of hard work has been put into it. And what it does for our investors is allows a lot of diversification, right? So you're no longer investing in a single asset and hoping that asset performs. We're gonna be purchasing six to 10 different assets in different markets, which gives a ton of diversification for our investors. So really excited about this and launching it to our investors. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate Podcast. My name is Peter Pomeroy, and I'm your host. Today, we have Sif Kafagi with us. Sif is an ex-techie turned real estate investor who has helped thousands of busy professionals diversify into real estate. After five years at Facebook, where he built the second largest engineering organization across the world, he founded TechVestor, which helps accredited investors passively invest in short-term rentals. A key differentiator of TechVestor is its proprietary sourcing technology, which allows them to underwrite over 100,000 properties a month so they can acquire the best properties for their investors. TechVestor is fresh off a $37 million first year of funding and is actively raising capital for its second portfolio as they become one of the leaders in institutionalizing the asset class of short-term rentals. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Peter. Cool. Thanks for being here. So, um, yeah, so let's just like let's jump right into it and uh, talk about like maybe some context. Tell us about your time at Facebook, and I mean, I'm everyone's always probably curious about your time at Facebook and what it was like building a, an engineering team, and and you know, kind of what then led you to leave um, Facebook. Yeah, you know, when when I joined, um, it was a super high growth time for Facebook, right? This is like 20, mid 2015, 16s in that general range. It's all a blur after you're there for quite a while. Um, but when I when I interviewed with some of the smartest people I'd ever been in a room with, and I knew that if I had the opportunity to join, I think it would have been a great decision. Obviously, in retrospect, it was. Um, but uh, a time when they were at the forefront of a lot of technology, and I was privileged enough to lead a team uh, in hiring for infrastructure uh, org, uh, which is all about reliability and sustainability of technology and infrastructure to make sure that Facebook can survive, grow and not go down, um, as well as the other products like Instagram and uh, some of those other things. Um, but the time was great, you know, worked with uh, a lot of great people and opened up a lot of offices for a lot of new teams uh, within our org. And I think that's really where I started to see a disconnect between uh, short-term rentals and, um, you know, this this lack of value that you get from it and why. And I was investing in multifamily at the time, right? And I was like, why has no one done short-term rentals on a syndication type basis? And I was like, there's probably a reason and there's a lot of reasons not to do it. <laughs> um, right. But if you but if you could fit, if you could solve for it, which I believe we have, and you know, we've done over $50 million now over the last two years, um, then I think there were that if someone can solve it, I think it's a it's a problem worth solving, and that's kind of what we did. All right, that's a, that's cool. So, and I want to go back to the, something you said, which was like it, it sounded like part of like the motivation to start um, your firm was that you were seeing a disconnect as you were as Facebook itself was growing into different offices and people were traveling like how they were like where they were staying and all of that. And we'll get so we're going to get to that in, in a sec, but. Um, talk about when you left Facebook, what that was like, and, you know, you may have, you know, your, your thoughts on that, but I was wondering it, myself was like, was that a gentle process or was it like, you know, you're like, Hey, I'm, I'm, you know, I need to move on. And all of a sudden like yeah. your computer was turned off and you were shutting <laughs> the door. And then, no. and then it, like that's part one. And then part two is, were you, did you have tech vester kind of going in advance of leaving? So, you know, just general thoughts on that would be awesome. 
Yeah. So, you know, I think I'd always had the entrepreneurial itch. Um, and I think that's exactly why they hired me to begin with, is to like build teams and infrastructure and orgs from the ground up. Um, and I was actually, what we were actually one week away from our first son's birth um, when I decided to leave. And many people would be like, what? <laughs> why? <laughs> right? You're, you're about to leave your, as they used to call it, a, my cushy golden handcuff job. Never forget those words. Um, as your son's about to be born, especially if the, you know this is like pandemic during the pandemic, and you're going to go do short term rentals. And at the time, uh, I actually had no idea I was going to be a tech investor. Uh, in fact, the reason I left wasn't to go do tech investor. The reason I left was to go be a more present father um, because I was a workaholic for most of my career and probably still am. But, uh, you know, when I was growing up, my dad worked three jobs and I didn't have a lot of time with him. And that's not something that I wanted to repeat. Um, you know, I wanted to uh, try to be as, as much of a father as I could. So, uh, w- you know, one week before birth, I, I left and I didn't know what I was going to do. I knew I would start something. Didn't know what that would be. I knew the problem with short-term rentals uh, existed. Um, and I started dabbling in, in things like software around the space but never really built anything until kind of later in 2020, uh, really like early to mid 2021. Um, and then from there, you started to get product market fit, right? Of where, you know, people are like actually paying attention to what you're doing and uh, they're giving you money and you're, you're starting to invest and starting to see some things kind of late towards 2021. Uh, but I did not leave with the intention of, of starting anything. I was not shown the door. It was a very nice uh, exit. Uh, for me, it was a quick one, not your typical, like I'm leaving in two weeks just because my wife was having a baby. Right, right, <laughs> so, right. You know, so for me, it was, a, you know, I'd love to do the farewell tour, but I'd, I'd rather just kind of go be with my wife during the last kind of week. Right. Um, and that's just, it was our first baby during a pandemic, you know, with COVID flying around. And um, we didn't know, not a lot of people knew about what was going on with COVID and like how serious or unserious it was at the time. Right. Um, so yeah, you know, it was a it was a great experience, but predominantly focused on just personal reasons to why I left. Uh, yeah. And then obviously, you know, I, I think I thought in the back of my mind that Techvester was not in it at that time. <laughs> right. All right. So then shifting to the problem that you you were interested in in solving, um, let's talk a little bit more about that. And I would like imagine, I mean, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but that the problem might have started to grow right in terms of like what you wanted to solve for like oh you know like initially maybe oh, yeah. it was like a concept and then it was like oh we can solve this and that and like so talk to us a little bit about that and how that progressed over time well i think the biggest thing is like when i was at facebook when you open up a new office i think a lot of people have the have this like misrepresentation in their head right like oh i'm going to work for facebook right or like you recruit people to facebook and that's actually rarely the case Usually what you're recruiting someone for is, hey, why don't you come work for Facebook? But like, that's not the primary thing that the the primary thing is, hey, would you be open to picking up your family of five, moving from St. Louis, Missouri to New York and working for Facebook? And the first thing is on their mind isn't if they like your company or if they're qualified. It's where are my kids going to go to school? Am I going to enjoy my life there? It's all these intangibles. So when you open up a new office, you have to think about where people are going to spend their time, where kids are going to go to school, what are the amenities, what does that location allow for, what's the cost of living, right? And so when we open up new offices, we would stay in those locations for like weeks at a time, right? Because we're, we're trying to figure out this physical infrastructure, you know, which vendors we're going to partner with and those types of things. And that we stayed in a lot of Airbnbs because we're there on a short-term basis and way, way more than I would have expected. Those Airbnbs were really shitty. Right. Um, at least for the value that you're getting. Right. And, you know, at the time, again, you know, I was investing in syndications like multifamily and I was like, why hasn't someone syndicated short-term rentals? And I was like, well, of course it's harder to scale, right? There's like one property at a time, finding them, doing that, all that. Um, so naturally like any good techie, I started building software uh, with my partner around, uh, you know, finding and identifying short term rentals. And, you know, people liked it, but no one wanted to use it. And then when we got someone to use it, they only wanted to buy one property. So in software, that's what we call churn. And that's a bad thing when someone uses your property and then uh, uses your product and then leaves. So then we offered it as a managed service where we used our own product to help you find a short term rental and offer you services around that. And we got a little bit of traction, but we got our most 
distraction, when we solved for the pain point of the investor, and I think you know this very well, which is I don't have the time, energy, know-how, or want to do this myself, but I want to get exposure to this asset class, which everyone was describing a syndication. So we, right. the products that we built, the software that we built, the technology that we built, the data that we've been able to aggregate, all of those things are like, okay, great. We need to go operate. It's not about selling software, which is what we thought we would be doing. We need to actually go operate. And if we can operate and offer people a passive way to invest in this asset class, everyone was really going to go on Airbnb and investing in short-term rentals. They just didn't want to do it. So how can we do that? How can we solve for that? And that's really where the connect came for, hey, let's do a syndication around this and this asset class. And if we can go solve for scaling this, which we have today, but that was a very painful road to getting here, um, then you know I think we could be really onto something and create that competitive edge. But it's very different than multi, right? You don't have 300 doors in the building, right? You got maybe... 100 doors across 10 states, time right. zones, locations. Like, how do you build that physical infrastructure? And that's really what we set out to solve. All right. So this is great. I mean, we're, we're going to get now right into your business model. And um, and um, so on your website, at the, like, I forget what the page is, but, and I would really encourage, I'll say this a number of times probably on this podcast is for listeners to go check out your website. Um, and, and I say that not for the opposite of because it's got a lot of flash and so forth. It, it's it's very elegant, but it, there's a lot of really digestible information. And I love the way it's presented. Um, it's presented in a way that is uh, digestible, interesting, and, and truthfully actionable. And, but one of the things that I saw on one of the pages is that your strategy is refreshingly simple and boring. And um, what struck me about that is that it's clearly important enough for you to have on your website. And so maybe we could start with that and tell me why that is imp like important enough to have on your website. Yeah. I think a lot of people think that we're like a technology company mm -hmm. or that we're trying to create this new asset class or change the world. Mm -hmm. um, and while that's great, like I'd love to tell you know stories of that to my kids one day. Um, you know, the idea that what we're doing is really, really simple. We're taking your existing single family home that exists today, and we are running it, operating it, designing it, amenitizing it, and executing on a business strategy in a market where 99% of the competition isn't. That's it, right? Um, in fact, just like in multifamily where you can buy a class B value add and push rents up by adding washers and dryers and renovations and all those types of things, while it seems... It's not rocket science. It's that someone's got to do it. And, you know, for us, most of the time we're competing against Grandpa Bob or, you know, someone else down the street who's got IKEA furniture with really shitty photography, no dynamic pricing, no idea of what hospitality is, no idea on how to execute on ranking and conversion on Airbnb's website. And it's because the market is not institutionalized. So if someone could institutionalize it or take that approach, the opportunity to do better is relatively simple. It's just the market doesn't do it. So that's why we believe what we're doing is really simple. It's really boring, but it's really effective when you think about delivering great returns. And so, you know, just to like, you know, beat this a little bit more, you're not a software that's like matching kind of people who want to rent space and, and landlords that have says you're actually buying the property. You're buying the furniture the furniture matches like, you know, the quality of the experience, hence your comment about like not to beat up on Ikea, but like yep. you're, you're, you're matching, you're matching that. So you're, 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 you're the landlord, you're the owner. Hence, like you have a hundred doors across 10 States. We can get to that in a minute. Um, and, and so you have that control and that allows you to, to deliver a consistent experience that, you know, maybe it's, you know, it might be consistent across your, your portfolio or certainly consistent with what the, you know, the renter is seeing on your screen and being promised, right? Yeah. And I think you hit it on the head, right? It's a continuous experience. And because we're vertically integrated, we own the entire stack, right? right? Um, we believe the problem in the industry historically is both the owner and the property manager. And right. we've stripped both of those out of the equation by being both. Right. And so now we can not only optimize for revenue, but we can optimize for profitability. And more importantly, we own both the dirt, the real estate and the operations behind it, allowing us to monetize across the entire stack. All right. This is great. All right. So let's get into pro property criteria a little bit. What kind of properties are you looking for? 
Um, what's your kind of your process and, and then your underwriting and, you know, talk, kind of walk me through that a little bit. Yeah. So our software is kind of typically where it starts. Like we're underwriting hundreds of thousands of properties a month, depending on what hits the market across 257 locations. Uh, we've entered about 10 of those today. Um, and from there, we're going to start window shopping, right? It's going to tell us just numerically if the if the property makes sense based on comps, uh, both on the real estate side, as well as the short-term rental side, right? Gross revenues. We're typically looking for a property that's going to do, on average, on a portfolio basis, a 20% revenue to purchase price. So if it's a half million dollar home, we're going to do about 100 grand in annual revenue. Um, and that's a, kind of like the bare minimum that we really want to look for. Some properties will be more, some properties will be less. It kind of goes both ways. Uh, we're typically targeting four bedroom homes or larger, usually, because we don't compete with hotels. Uh, and depending on the local market, this is kind of where things start to differ quite a bit. Um, in places uh, like Arizona, which I know you guys are in, we're looking for those large backyards, resort style amenities. So we can add pickleball and basketball and you know mini golf and golf simulators and volleyball courts, because that's the type of amenities that that market demands. All in places in, say, like the East Coast, where it's more a little bit more cavity, um, you're not going to get those resort style yards, but you're going to want game rooms and basements and movie room, movie theater rooms and those types of things because you're going to host a family of 14 who are there while it's while they're snowed in. It's a snowy experience, right? Um, so depending on the hyper local market, our criteria changes, but on a numerical basis, we're typically looking for that revenue to purchase price ratio on a, on a basic scale. All right, that's that's helpful. Um, I mean, you met, you mentioned like, you know, a snowy, you know, and I, I know that like in the East Coast, there's four seasons. So like it snows, in one of, <laughs> it, it snows in at least one of them. But um, are you avoiding locations where there's like, you know, you're going to rent it primarily in one season or two seasons and you're seeking? Oh, yeah. Okay, talk, share a little bit more about that. Yeah, most of our markets are going to be at least three season markets. Okay. And because we're better operators than average, we typically see regardless of season, we're going to see an average of about 74 to 85% annual occupancy. All right. Right. So like uh, industry standard or industry average, I should say, is typically going to be between like 54 and 60 at best. And we're going to see ourselves doing... 30, 40% better than that really at any given time. Um, and it's because we're optimizing with pricing, with amenities. Like for example, this sounds really crazy and this is a really simple one, but like in cold markets, if you have a hot tub, you'll likely be more booked in the winter not having one, right? And that's a more obvious one in the short-term rental space, but there are similar types of ideas in every single market that you would typically do. Right, that's, that's awesome. All right, so who's your customer? Is your customer, well, just, I'll just leave it at that. Who's your customer? Yeah. So it's anyone who's going to be tra traveling, you know, vacations, groups that are typically seven, 10, 15 people. Um, they're going to find us through Verbo or Airbnb. We don't do direct bookings too often. Okay. Um, I would say over 90% of our bookings are going to come through those OTAs. And, you know, they're going to be coming for, you know, family vacations, family trips to get away for the weekend. Um, you know, bachelorette, bachelor parties, um, all those types of things. But the majority I would say that we serve is like your typical flexible mobility type family, um, especially post pandemic. So our thesis is very simple is that post pandemic, we believe the world will forever be more mobile than it was, right? That uh, this American dream of having a, a picket, white picket fence in a single family home that you own is actually quite dead. Right. That's not what we believe the future will be. We believe people will value their time and flexibility a lot more a decade from now and therefore will value more flexible living arrangements than ever before. Right. So that's why we firmly believe in what we're doing from a mobility perspective and why we amenitize and focus on the type of group sizes that we do. That's great. And what I what I really appreciate about your answer is it's consistent with your product type and it's not everybody. <laughs> your answer is, your answer not, is not everybody. everybody. <laughs> Right. It's definitely um, not I mean, everybody. I, you know, <laughs> um, so, all right. So just like, you know, I know it's like we're hitting on a bunch of different stuff, but, uh, but I'm excited about what you're doing. Um, talk a little bit about your exit. How do you ex like, how do you monitor? Like, I know you monetize your cash flow for sure, but what, like, what are, are there many exits where you sell a property and, and then, you know, trade into a different one and like, talk a little bit about that. Like what, what the options scenarios might look like. Yeah. I would say we have predominantly, three options when we think about exits and kind of going from like most likely to least likely. 
So our most likely exit is to exit the portfolio based on some sort of multiple or cap rate, as I'm sure you're aware, very similar to multifamily. You package a hundred or a thousand properties, sell it off to private equity or some large buyer who's going to buy it at some multiple of revenue or multiple of NOI. Um, so we've actually done that eight times where we sold our homes for somewhere between a five and a half and a six and a half cap. And we have mass institutional interests who have already indicated that they would love an opportunity to, you know, explore buying the portfolio as we continue to scale it. No one wants to buy one. They want to buy hundreds, right? Especially those large, big players. They want to write a big check. Uh, so that's projected to be about a five-year hold. Your typical syndication terms, right? Double your capital every five years. That's roughly kind of what the, what the industry standard will look like. Uh, secondly, uh, we can exit these homes back to the retail market, either one by one as single family homes, right? Based on value and comps, right? As, as they've been sold for the last hundreds of years, that one's going to be somewhere between a five and 10 year old realistically. Um, and of course, cash flowing nicely along the way, that'll get you a 10, 12, 13, 14 IRR, somewhere in that general range, right? Depending on how values will fluctuate over time. Um, and of course, third, um, and probably least likely is strategic refinance of along the way, right? To get principal equity back, continue holding for longer than expected, um, but obviously continue, uh, you know, figuring it out along the way as, as the industry matures. So our exit options are actually not very different than multifamily. They're in fact quite similar, quite right. identical. Right. Your website, and I didn't prep you for this, so I apologize, yeah. but, you know, we'll, we'll go into it in whatever depth we we want. Um, your website has a, da a data page, which I really liked. Um, I like it because of, again, the presentation is super easy to understand. And I just wanted to give you, um, well, one, I guess I wanted to, like the first question might be, here's the second question. I'll tell you the second question first, and we'll go to the first question. The second question is, you know, are, are there any data points? We've talked to, to um, s several of them already, but are there any data points you wanted to, you know, bring forth? Uh, because it's a compelling page. The first question is, why did you want to have a data page, a date, you know, on your website to allow investors to like, you know, kind of open up the hood a little bit, you know, without getting lost? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, like we are uh, an incredibly, as you said it earlier, professionally simple and boring company. And when I talk about that, I also talk about how we make decisions. We're incredibly logical, we're unhinged, um, and we follow the data. So we want investors to understand that this industry is a lot more mature than you'd think, right? Just because no one's really tried to do what we've done doesn't mean that the data doesn't support it. And you and I both know that getting investors comfortable with really any business plan, acquisition, strategy, market, asset, asset cost, et cetera, starts with education. Um, and data is really hard to argue with, right? right? Um, and so when I look at, say, 2023 data, if I told you that demand for short-term rentals is up between 10 and 15% and one and the highest ever on record, if I told you that $150 billion industry, half of which that happens here in the United States, if I told you that demand pacing is up 10 to 15% as well, meaning people are booking out further in advance than they ever have before. And if I told you that the numbers, number of nights booked and Airbnbs booked is up nearly 20% year over year, right? And telling you that all of these things are the types of strategic decisions and strategic alignment that we use to make decisions for how we run and operate our funds, then you might feel more inclined or more comfortable with the business plan to know, like, and trust not only us, but the asset class, right? And I think that's our biggest challenge is education. And we were joking about this right before we started the podcast, which is, you know, our biggest challenge isn't necessarily, um, you know, what we do. It's educating people that what we do is even possible. Can't tell you how many times we hear, how can you manage 100 plus doors in 10 plus states remotely? And that's a very difficult problem to solve, but you know we answer it with technology, with data, and with insights. Um, and with multifamily, it's similar, right? Like when you are more vertically integrated, there's advantages to that. Uh, we've even we've even heard from people who are a little less, um, you know, educated. In my opinion, that being vertically integrated is a bad thing. And that's where you, you ask yourself, well, why do you think that, right? What data can I show you? Because I can show you a plethora of data that being vertically integrated is a good thing, right? So tell me why you think it's a bad thing. Right. And so, you know, for us, that data page serves as a 
go do your own research. And, you know, when we send you our data room after you, uh, you get a chance to talk to us, literally all it is is a plethora of data, right? So here's what we've done. Here's why we do it. Here's how we do it. Here's the data that supports what we do, right? And here's why we, we, we kind of tied all this stuff together in a narrative. But on top of that, our data also talks about our people, right? Um, you know, as someone who's worked in talent and recruiting at Facebook for five years, one thing I will tell you that's adamantly true in any successful company, it's people matter more than anything else. And I think you guys at VSV can really um, attest to that. The people that you have matter more than the deal, than the debt structure, more than anything else. It's execution at the end of the day. And we have the best team in this space by far and above. It's the First and only thing I'm proudest of as being a leader is the level of caliber of talent that we have. So if I can educate you with data, talk to you about our team, show you the $50 million in traction that we used to get here, you're more likely to uh, consider the opportunity. That's excellent. Thank, thanks for that. And, and thanks for that um, explanation. Um, and I would really encourage listeners to go and check out the data page, not only for the you know compelling information on short-term rentals, and uh, the demand for it, but also the kind of the flip side, which is the uh, needed supply. I mean, one of the things that popped out for me is the um, the data point where there's uh, two million more hosts are needed. Um, yep. And so, I mean, it's re- it's really it's pr- pretty neat. But the other the other piece is how it's presented again. And uh, you know, we're always presenting data, and sometimes, like I mean, my experience, I mean, I've done it w- really well sometimes, and sometimes I've fallen short where investors are like, I don't know what he's talking about. And, uh, you know, it's a learning lesson. So um, it's a great example. So thanks for that. All right. So we're going to we're going to wrap it up with the the last couple questions here. And um, uh, so, you know, TechVestor, you've you've quickly scaled zero to thirty seven million in in one year. And I know that there's a lot of work that's gone on before that. But for purposes of this question, um, you know, you've probably heard this 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 um, kind of call to action, which is, you know, take massive action. And I was curious, like, you know, in the context of going from zero to $37 million, um, you know, just gen- what, what what kind of floats to the top when you hear, like, take massive action? I think you're asking, like, what the hell did we do to get there? And what kind of led to that success? You know, and I think the first thing that we did is we thought outside the box, right? What we thought is, where are our existing investors today? And as we kind of joked a little earlier, you know, education was a big part of it that lacked in the space. And we said, we're going to target multifamily investors, people who understood investing in syndications, but perhaps had never seen a short-term rental asset class. And we started there. And I think that caught a lot of attention. And today we spend a ton of money on growth, right? A quarter million dollars a month on marketing, branding, and positioning. Um, and while a lot of people may look at that and be like, wow, right, that's a lot of money on, on you know, growth associated events. Um, you, we, we took action by taking a risk, right? Putting our money where our mouth is, believing in what we do, getting on podcasts like this, getting the word out, hustling. We didn't spend a quarter million dollars a month on day one, right? We worked our way up. We generated revenue. We proved concept. We iterated. We pivoted. We looked at data and we consistently said, how can I get better? Um, and I think we've boiled our company down to under five metrics that will tell us if our company is successful or not, right? So we have a very, very dedicated North Star, and we really look at a few things. And if those things are green, then we're going to feel really, really good about where we're. If those things are red, then we need to make some really big changes. Um, and a lot of companies, I think, get lost in the fluff, right? They're like, well, we need all these little things to be green, and we feel really good, and ROI here, and ROI here. And I'm like, well, for us, it's under five things. It's like, what's our return on capital that we spent, right, on a marketing perspective? Are we hitting our double-digit cash? Yeah, fantastic, great. Right? And three, are we able to attract and retain the best possible talent? And if all those things are yes or green, then we feel very good about the about the future where we're headed. That's excellent. All right, last question. Uh, life of an entrepreneur, you know, we, we all know it has its ups and downs. It requires a lot of hours, a lot of work. It can be stressful. Can you share any practices that you might have that allow you to maintain, you know, your physical, mental health, well-being, um, so that you can keep, you know, be your best self day in, day out, not only at work, but at home? I intentionally disconnect a few times a week uh, to get outside. Um, And I live in sunny, you know, Southern California, so I'm privileged to have that. 
Um, and more recently, it's more about getting active with my wife. So we are, you know, off the heels of our second baby that we've had um, and being more active and finding time for us away from parenting and work is important. Um, and currently we're really into pickleball. So we okay. go and like, we, you know, we play some pickleball, we take a walk. Uh, I know it's crazy, but we are firm believers in our physical health. Uh, that allow us to perform at our peak for our family, for our children, for ourselves, and of course, uh, for work. So those are things that we do intentionally multiple times a week. Um, and we have date night at least once a week. Uh, I think that's important to always keep dating. I think a healthy family leads to a healthy business many times. Excellent. Steve, thank you for coming on the show. If listeners would like to get a hold of you, what is the best way for them to do that? Yeah, they can visit techfester.com. They can visit that data page that you mentioned, request an invite as well on the top right. Um, get to know short-term rentals. Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Be happy to reach out and answer any questions you might have. Excellent. And for those listeners that would like to connect with me or would like to be on the show, please feel free to shoot me an email, peter at verticalstreetventures.com or connect on LinkedIn. And as always, please consider subscribing to the show and if moved, please leave a five-star review so we can continue to have terrific guests like Seif share their insight with us. And with that, thank you for listening, and I wish you all a terrific week. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please go to iTunes and leave a rating and written review to help us grow and reach more listeners. Subscribe too, so you can get the latest episodes. Lastly, to stay updated, head on over to Vertical Street Ventures. Com. If you're interested in learning more about what we do, you can schedule a call with our team on the website. Thanks again for joining us. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode.